All right, good afternoon. Uh, are you ready to uh, go? Okay. What I'd like to do is um, comment uh, in respect to three aspects, uh, and it seems to me that there are three clear aspects to this uh, matter. Uh, the first is the investigation in relation to the allegations of excessive force by police. Uh, that um, investigation uh, has had two developments today. Um, the first is that it will now be a joint investigation with the Crime and Misconduct Commission and the Ethical Standards Command, uh, and that will commence forthwith in terms of the joint nature of the investigation. Uh, the second development is, which is only very recent as well, is that the officer who is the primary subject of the investigation uh, is going to be removed from operational duties uh, until further advised and will continue to work um, but in a non-operational role uh, until this matter, uh, until the investigation further progresses. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can be assured that the, there is and will be a full, thorough and exhaustive uh, investigation of this matter. Um, but until the investigation is complete, it's not appropriate for me to prejudge it or to determine the outcome, and obviously I can't and won't do that. Um, but I can assure you and I can assure the public that uh, it will be full, complete and thorough. Uh, the second aspect, from my perspective, is in terms of the reporting, and particularly in the Courier Mail this morning, uh, there was reference uh, to an officer and perhaps I could just quote some of the comments. Uh, an officer said, bashings were not rare, but complaints often were dismissed. Uh, you have three or four officers bashing one member of the public who is usually quite drunk. It is the word of four police officers against some bloke. Tell me who you think uh, they are going to believe. Now, I encourage and urge that officer to come forward uh, and uh, provide all evidence, information, um, concerns that that officer has to either the Ethical Standards Command or to the CMC, but it is critical that that officer come forward with that information. Um, we've come a long way in the Queensland Police Service post-Fitzgerald. This year is 25 years since the start of the Fitzgerald inquiry, and the officer has my absolute assurance that he or she uh, will be totally protected and supported uh, if they come forward with uh, information uh, that is valid. Um, there's no question of that. If there are any doubt at all, what I urge the officer to do is to contact the CMC and discuss the matter. Now, that's really important. And the third aspect is a broader perspective in terms of, again, some of the reporting that's occurred. Uh, and what I would like to do is just share some, uh, you know, information and some data with you in a broader perspective, both statewide for the state of Queensland and in particular for the Gold Coast District, and if you could just bear with me in relation to that. Uh, we are going to put out a media release later, we just haven't had time to finalise that at the moment. So within probably 30 minutes of concluding this press conference there will be a media release going out, uh, touching on those three topics. The investigation, uh, the person, uh, the police officer who needs to come forward, and some of these broader uh, details. And as well, if there's anything follow -up, in a follow-up since later, I'm happy to uh, try and assist you with that. Um, for about the last five years, the number of complaints of excessive force in Queensland has been around the same. It's fluctuated between around six and 700. That's the number of complaints. Now, uh, there are two measures. One is the complaints, the number of complaints, and another is the number of allegations. So one person might, for example, complain that when arrested by the police, uh, that the handcuffs were applied too tightly uh, and that they were uh, pushed uh, too harshly into the back seat of the car. That's two allegations. It's one complaint of excessive force, but it's two allegations. One allegation is that the handcuffs were too tight. The second allegation is that they were pushed too roughly uh, into the back of the car. So that's the distinction. And each year, for at least the last five years, there's been about six to 700 complaints. What's significant about that is that in that five-year period, we've had more police. Um, so, in reality, the rate of complaints is actually you know, going down. Uh, we think that's an important thing. We do, however, take every one of these complaints uh, very seriously. Uh, all complaints of excessive use of force are referred to the Crime and Misconduct Com Commission. Every complaint of excessive use of force is referred to the Crime and Misconduct Commission. They see those complaints. 
at some stage uh, in their process, usually at the outset. Uh, I'd like to talk about, for a moment, if you'd allow me to, about the police who were assaulted themselves. Um, last year, last statistical year of our um, 10,557 police, 2,331 were assaulted. Um, the rate of assault statewide was 220 officers assaulted, 221 officers assaulted for every 1,000 police, or in perhaps more simpler terms, uh, 22 for every 100. So for every 100 police statewide, 22 were assaulted last year. However, in the Gold Coast District, for every 100 police, 37 were assaulted. So the statewide figure is 22 for every 100 police. For the Gold Coast District, it's 37 police assaulted. Um, the, the main street offences is... All of these street offences are referred to as public nuisance, offen public nuisance offences. Uh, last year there were 26,641 public nuisance offences. We have 31 police districts. The district with the highest number of these public nuisance offences is Brisbane Central District, which takes in the city and the valley. Uh, the second highest district is the Gold Coast District. The rate of public nuisance offences per 100,000 for the Gold Coast District was 931 for every 100,000 people. And by comparison for other places in the state, Ipswich is 389, Wynnum is 206, and Caboolture is 386. And Surface Paradise alone has 230 licensed premises, just in Surface Paradise, in that Surface Paradise Police Division. Um, as well, and I've touched on this, um, the the rate of complaints um, across the state is coming down and the surveys that determine, the national surveys that determine general public satisfaction with police, where people have been in contact police in the last 12 months, in the most recent survey, uh, the Queensland Police Service rated 85% satisfaction and the national average was 82%. So in, in a broader statewide perspective, um, I, I think uh, whilst there's always room for improvement, I don't believe things have gone backwards, OK? And I don't believe we're at a crisis point. But I want to reassure you that we take any complaint of excessive use of force seriously, uh, and it's an important issue. Having said that, it's also important to recognise uh, that police officers do a difficult job, a job that often, often compromises their own safety, and we have to find the right balance here. Um, and... Uh, in some areas in the state, and surface paradise is one, uh, it's more difficult than it is in other areas, and the statistics bear that out. All right, thank you for listening to me in that space. I'm happy to take your questions. So when did ethical standards or the police hierarchy become aware of this allegation? Uh, not. Uh, the matter was not actually reported until the 6th of February. Um, the incident occurred on the 29th of January, but the gentleman concerned did not report it until the 6th of February. And the Ethical Standards Command, I can assure you, have um, been um, doing quite a bit uh, since it first came to their notice. Why would this man, uh, the officer allegedly involved, stood down until today after the media reporting? Uh, the media reporting, uh, there's been developments today which I can't go into, which have resulted in the officer being removed uh, from operational duties. He has not been stood down. Um, what about the other officers concerned? Are they still on the beat? Yes, they are. Investigation until, and into how the footage was leaked to the Korea Mail? Uh, that's um, going to be looked at. Yes, it is. Yes. Would, would you say that. Um, Can I just add to that? It's important that, that whoever the person is, and I'm not saying it's the same person who gave the footage to the Korea Mail, I don't know, um, but um, giving the footage to the Korea Mail is not a whistleblower act. Uh, the gentleman had made the complaint and the Ethical Standards Command had the footage. So we need, I think, to be really clear about that. Uh, that is not a whistleblower act. Uh, there's nothing there... That, just let me finish, please. There's nothing there that's exposing or uncovering anything. The complaint had been made. It was being investigated. The Ethical Standards Command had the footage. What someone has done is give the footage selectively to one media outlet, and that's not appropriate. Is that something they'd be disciplined over? Well, we'll wait and see. Uh, but the distinction I wanted to draw is whoever has made these comments to the Courier Mail that are on the front page of the paper today should come forward. That's the comments about drunks being bashed. 
that person must come forward. We must get to the bottom of that, clear that up and find out what's happening in that space. It's a separate issue, and it may not be the same person, about the leakage of the CCTV footage to the courier mail. Hasn't it sped up the process, though? That officer wasn't stood down until this has been exposed? No, I don't believe it actually has. It's just part of an ongoing investigation, and since the Ethical Standards Command started on this, only after it was reported on the 6th of February, uh, together with uh, other senior officers on the Gold Coast, uh, there's been an ongoing, you know, inve they've, been, they've been investigating this and progressing it every day. So I think, I think that the progression of it to the decision today to remove the officer from operational duties would have occurred anyway. Yeah. If it was a result of the media, I'd tell you, but it, it's not my view that it is. There are claims that that particular station has a fairly rugged reputation for thuggery. Uh, well, uh, that's, well what, what should happen in that space is if that's the case, uh, then that needs to be backed up you know, with complaints and evidence. Uh, and if it is the case, um, we will um, do everything we can and we will address that situation and remedy that. But um, claims like that, claims like that need to be backed up with evidence. Uh, last year's issue with Ely Beach and uh, a few years ago the Bruce Row incident in Queen Street Mall. Do you think there is a problem in, with the police service with violence or are they isolated incidents that have just come to the public life? Uh, I don't believe that there's a systemic uh, organisational problem. Um, what I do believe is that um, your police, my police, the Queensland Police Service, uh, are nearly 11,000 men and women who are drawn from the community, who did slightly over six months training uh, and go out onto the street and they face and deal with the most difficult and dangerous of circumstances. They're also subject to all of the normal human stresses that we are all subject to in our daily lives. Um, and what can happen is um, people can come desensitised when they're dealing with violence and difficult situations and over and over. Uh, and sometimes um, their judgement can be frayed. We have nearly 11,000 police every day, every day in Queensland, at a conservative estimate, we have over 14,000 interactions with the community. That's everything from arresting people for being drunk and disorderly to investigating them and interviewing them over serious crimes to random breath testing them, over 14,000 interactions with the community. Of those 14,000 interactions daily, there's less than 10 complaints made. Less than 10 complaints. And if you think about the nature of police work, then I think, whilst I'd like to see it as less, I think that's acceptable. Um, I, I think it's uh, also um, important to say that I do believe that we have come a long way. Uh, today, a significant number of complaints against police are made by their colleagues against other police, and that's at least a quarter of the complaints. Now, in terms of organisational culture, that's a significant change. Does it concern you at all that this was done in a watch house where police knew there would be a camera there and they were captured on that security camera? Does it concern you at all that if they're willing to do it there, then what's going on yeah, outside with, the with respect, I think you're prejudging it. Um, and we need to wait. From my position, uh, others can prejudge it if they wish to, but we need to wait and determine um, what the police versions are, what the explanations are, what the accounts are, and then make a judgment after all of that's done. I'm not prejudging. You admit that the vision is fairly, it looks fairly I'm commercial. not prejudging it either way. I'm not prejudging it either way. What I'm saying to you is that I'm not going to prejudge it. Is there a, what was your initial reaction? You what was your initial reaction when you first saw the vision? When I first saw the vision, uh, my, my reaction is that this matter requires, and it is receiving, a thorough and full investigation, and that is occurring. Is there ever a circumstance where it would be okay for a police officer to punch someone in the head? Uh, of, well, of course, but we couldn't get into hypotheticals. Um, it would depend on the circumstances, and as to whether that use of force punching someone in the head was necessary and justifiable. And that's what you have to do with every one of these things, is to examine it in that sense. How long will the investigation take, Commissioner? I wish I could give that answer. It'll be finished as soon as we possibly can. Um, but uh, there is still more to do, and, I, and, and I'm only you know, speculating here as best as I can estimate, but I would think it would be at least uh, several weeks before it's concluded, but that's at least. Because sometimes with these things, the investigative journey takes you into other areas that need to be looked at, but I would think at least several weeks. Are you able to tell us 
the rank or perhaps experience of the officer that's been uh, removed from operational duties? Uh, I'd rather not comment on that. Um, but not, not a high-ranking or greatly experienced officer with the Queensland Police Service. The particular officer had served in another jurisdiction before joining us. As in another, uh, outside of police, you mean? No, no, another policing jurisdiction before he joined the Queensland Police Service. But I, but I don't have his length of service uh, in that other jurisdiction. Is being desensitised an excuse? Oh, no, but, but um, it, it, no, of course not. If, if someone uses excessive force, um, yeah, sorry, if a police officer uses excessive force, then that's not appropriate. That's not inappropriate. Um, what I'm saying is, is that I ask you to accept that policing is a difficult job, is often a dangerous job, uh, and that police deal with people on a daily basis who can be very difficult. And, um, and in some cases and in some places, they do that over and over and over again each day. And what I'm saying is that people can, and I'm not talking about this case because I have no knowledge in respect of the circumstances of this case, and I've just said that, we're not going to prejudge it, um, but the question was asked more broadly, and what I've said is, is that, and maybe look, if I could just restate it, is this, that we've got nearly 11,000 police. Um, we, we have 14,000, over 14,000 interactions with the community every day. Each year we arrest around 85,000 people, around 85,000 people each year. We're a large police department and there's over 4 million people in Queensland. I can't sit here and say to you um, that no police officer will ever use excessive force. What I can say to you is that we take complaints seriously, but we go beyond that and we monitor behaviour. Uh, we have supervision um, in respect to these things. And what I can say to you is that the level of complaints is not increasing, and if anything, it's coming down. So I don't believe we have a crisis situation, but it's something we have to monitor all the time, all the time. But it hasn't been a great week for Queensland Police, has it? It's never a... Well, it's a terrible uh, situation when the first four pages of the state's major newspaper are covered with, uh, com you know, allegations and, and a story that relates to... Um, you know, uh, excessive use of force. Yeah, that's that's not good for us at all. Uh, and you have my commitment uh, that there will be a thorough and full and complete and exhaustive investigation. Uh, and not just, and this is not just in relation to one issue. Obviously, in a broader sense, uh, we we will do and are doing and do do all we can to minimise um, our officers using excessive force. My point is simply that it's a difficult job, um, and um, we can't say to you. Uh, that there will never be a complaint of this nature. Look, there could have been a, a day lag in that. I'm just not sure it would be tend. I, I don't know what time on the 6th the complaint was made, so Ethical Standards Command may well have received it uh, that day, but I wouldn't imagine it would have been later than the next day. There wasn't an investigation that began at a local level first. It was referred straight, or it was referred to ethical standards as well. Correct, and, and the investigation wouldn't have commenced until at least the 6th, more likely around the 7th. And my point was simply that you have my assurance, uh, because I've been briefed by the Ethical Standards Command about this today, uh, that they have um, done a very effective and thorough job to date, you know, in terms of um, doing all they, they have. And there's still more to be done. Did you call in the CMC or did the CMC come to the police and say they want to... No, that was the CMC's determination, uh, and but it's one that I support. Uh, there are a range of options into how these things are done. Um, it can either be... Generally, there's only three... Uh, one is that the Ethical Standards Command do it uh, and the CMC review their work. And um, the second is that it's a joint investigation, which have, the CMC have determined today that it will be. And the third option is that the CMC take it over entirely and we, we only assist and support where appropriate. And we're in the middle stage at the moment where the CMC and the uh, police service will do it from here on in as a joint investigation. Uh, well, the, the scope of the investigation, there's one officer who is the primary subject of the investigation, who is the officer who today has been um, uh, removed from operational duties. Um, the other officers who are featured in the CCTV have been all interviewed and may, uh, may, may need to be re-interviewed. That will depend on how the investigation unfolds. And there will be other officers interviewed as well and may already have been. I don't have the precise detail of every 
uh, aspect of the investigation, but that will include officers who were at the watch house uh, when this gentleman was taken to the watch house. But they won't be the subject of any potential disciplinary action, only that one that's been stood down for operational use? That's too early to say. Yeah. And just, are there any other officers um, investigated at the moment for excessive force? Uh, each year uh, in Queensland, uh, for the last five years, there have been about six to 700 complaints of excessive force. Every single one of those matters is investigated, and at any given time there will be a number of police under investigation. So what has been the result of those investigations? Have any actually been disciplined as a result of those Oh, yes. yes. Um, I can come back to you with some data on that. It might take a day or so. Uh, most of the complaints are not substantiated after investigation. So how many officers have been interviewed? And, and might I say that, that the, the majority, you know, the, a significant majority are not substantiated after investigation. And most are on the Gold Coast too, aren't they? No, no, they're statewide. Yeah. You said other than the primary subject who's been stood down, the other officers have already been interviewed. How many have already been interviewed? I can't tell you that. I, I, there would be at least four or five. Uh, but all of the officers who were shown on the CCTV have been interviewed at this point in time. I think there have been others interviewed as well. You mentioned you've served in other jurisdictions. Is that within Australia or out yeah, My only comment is that the, you asked me the officer's work history and experience and rank. I'm um, saying that he is not a very senior officer um, and that he has not been with us for a long time, but he was with another policing jurisdiction, and that's all I'd like to say about it, that, that at this stage. If, if that changes, obviously, we'll, we'll share that with you. But there's no need to go further at this time. And the officer who may or may not have released the footage to the Courier-Mail may face disciplinary action? Um, uh, we believe that it's... Um, it's something that needs to be examined in terms of who leaked the CCT footage. Might I say, though, uh, that that's not the primary thrust of our inquiries. The primary issue here is the complaint of excessive use of force. Um, but certainly the leakage of the footage is something that we need to look into. Would that officer have been stood down today if that footage hadn't have been leaked? Um, uh, I believe so. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. The officer has not been stood down. Uh, and I know... He's taken off operational duties. Yeah, that, 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 yeah for, for us... Can I just explain why I said that? For us, stood down is a significant step in the disciplinary process, OK? Uh, the officer has not been stood down. The officer is still working but has been removed from operational duties as from today uh, and we will continue to work but in a non-operational office-type environment. Okay. And, and in my view, you know, if I can come to the second part of your question, if someone else asked the same question before, and in my view, that would have, would have occurred regardless of whether the media coverage had occurred, uh, because that was part of the unfolding nature of the investigation. And if it had been the case that it occurred before the media coverage, I'd be happy to tell you that, uh, but that's not my view. It, it, it would be across the full range of action that could be taken. Uh, now, the most extreme action that could be taken would be a criminal charge. Um, the next most extreme action would be a disciplinary hearing for misconduct before a deputy commissioner that could result in dismissal from the service. Um, at the, this is some. I'm sorry, we're talking here where excessive force is substantiated. Yeah, okay. Uh, the other end uh, would be what's called managerial guidance where if, for example, a person said that um, the handcuffs were applied too tightly and in the view of the people conducting the investigation, indeed they were, and that was unnecessary, that would be managerial guidance. In your knowledge, has anyone ever been sacked for excessive force? Um, uh, yes, I believe they have, but I can't recall the precise detail and I'd have to come back to you with that, uh, with that information. Yeah. Is the officer still on full pay? Or has been uh, yes, well, he's continuing to work, yes, yes. Okay, uh, Can I ask you a question about yesterday? Uh, there's been quite a bit of support for you on TalkBack and online for your speeding ticket. Uh, does that bore you? Does it bore me? Does it bore you, as in are you bored by Oh, this no, not at all. Um, as I said yesterday, what's the most important thing for me with all of this is that the efforts and work you know, in, in reducing the road toll uh, continue and that my transgression doesn't diminish that in any way. Um, and um, I... Uh, I, that, at the risk of being repetitive, that, that is just such an important issue. 
Uh, and uh, so, uh, I mean, I'm grateful for the um, community support uh, that we've received. I'm particularly grateful for the support we've had from the media. I, I genuinely believe that we can save lives, and we demonstrate that, you know, in terms of what we've done. I mean, back in 1973, 73, um, you know, there were a fraction of the drivers and cars on the road that there are today, and the road toll was 638 in 1973. Two years ago, in 2010, it was 249, and in Queensland we have 3 million drivers, 4 million cars, you know, um, and, and we got the road toll down from 638 to 249. And the reason we did that was because we changed attitude and behaviour. And, and we do that through three things. We do it through enforcement, we do it through engineering, in other words, better cars with seat belts and airbags, and, and we do it through educa edu educating and changing the community's values. And one of the greatest things the media have done in that space uh, alone is, is been drink driving. Uh, I can remember a time when drink driving was socially acceptable. Um, and, and today, through campaigns like the Bloody Idiot campaign, it's not, and people have changed their behaviours. So um, that's a magnificent achievement, I think, you know, to reduce the road toll from 638 to 249. And I believe we can, we can, you know, my, my, I suppose my dream for it, is, if you like, is that, uh, and maybe it's unrealistic, is that we could get it under 200, and we'd be up, up with the uh, safest countries in the world, who are much smaller countries, places like Norway and Sweden and Denmark, that are much smaller countries than ours and have obviously much better road networks. So, yeah, I think we should always try to do better. Just one more thing, Commissioner. Um, just clarification, when I say that the um, complaints, there seem to be more, we got the OPRs on the, um, the complaints against the police, and Gold Coast had more than other places. Why is that so? Uh, well, I think if you look at those statistics, uh, that demonstrate that, that compared to the state average where 22 um, police per 100 police are assaulted on average statewide and in the Gold Coast district it's 37 to 38 uh, and where you look at the rate of public nuisance matters um, look, look, probably the primary reason is our two uh, most difficult areas in terms of uh, public nuisance alcohol-related behaviour, uh, Brisbane Central District, which takes in the valley and the city, uh, which has, um, I think, something in the order of 550 licensed premises, um, and the Gold Coast District, which is primarily that area around Surface Paradise and Broadbeach, and you just have that massive volume of nightclub and, you know, um, licensed premises activity. It doesn't mean that, that, in my view, that the police at Surface Paradise uh, are any different from the police at Mount Isa or in Cairns or Townsville. It's just that they deal with a different policing set of circumstances, and it's a challenging set of circumstances. So more drunk people, basically, more violence on both sides? Uh, well, I think that's, with respect, um, a bit of a, a long bow to draw. Um, it's without question that at surface um, and in the city and valley, I mean, uh, if you go into the city and valley uh, or at surface, on Friday night, Saturday morning, around two in the morning, it can be quite a spectacle. Uh, and some Queenslanders would be very surprised at, at what they saw in that space in terms of the number of people and the behaviour of those people. So if you have that environment, um, then it's inevitable that the police there are going to be a lot busier than they will be with respect at Warwick or Toowoomba. You know, now that's no, you know, that's no discredit to the police at Warwick or Toowoomba and, and, and it's not to discredit to anyone, it's just you have to police according to the circumstances. Can you guarantee that the unnamed quoted officer will be protected and supported if he comes forward? Absolutely. Yeah, and I encourage that person, he or she, to come forward because that is really important. That um, If that officer um, has, the con has, has information, concerns, evidence, it's really important that the officer comes forward and has my absolute assurance they'll be fully protected and supported. Can I just ask you how the crim track deal with uh, New Zealand is going? Yeah, it's, well, I, I think it's going well in the sense that um, the, the agreement um, between the national governments was a significant breakthrough in my view. Um, what, what is happening now is we're in dialogue with the other two key players, that's CrimTrack um, and the New Zealand Government. Um, and um, the Assistant Commissioner in charge of our Information, uh, Information Communications Technology Command, Assistant Commissioner Paul Stewart, is working with um, those other entities uh, to develop a bit of a scoping project concept in terms of what needs to be done 
um, in, in a practical sense, a technology sense, and obviously we need to explore what the cost is going to be. Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know at this stage. Okay, nothing else? Thanks very much for your time.